Welcome to today's second talk by Jeff Kosev from the Naval Academy on Hamilton's private key. Let's give a big hand to Dan Hillman. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be here to be talking about probably a different topic than is being covered at most of DEF CON, but I promise you will see how it is relevant by the end of the uh, presentation. And just a very bit, of, a bit of background about me and what my interests are. Uh, I'm a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy's Cyber Science Department, and uh, uh, ladder. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I actually am just getting over a cold in uh, August, which is kind of odd. But um, so please let me know if you uh, have any trouble hearing me. Uh, so I'm a professor in the U.S. Naval, Depart Naval Academy Cyber Science Department, and we have created a cyber operations major, uh, graduated our first class of undergraduate cyber ops majors in 2016. Uh, it has now grown so that 10% of our rising sophomores at the entire Naval Academy are majoring in cyber operations. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. I'm a lawyer by training, and I teach the midshipmen about cybersecurity law and policy. So uh, that's my background, and before I get into the substance of this presentation, I have to give the standard disclaimer that they always make me give. Uh, what I say today is not the view of the government, Naval Academy, Department of Navy, who else, Department of Defense. Um, my family doesn't usually like to um, go by what I say, so uh, sometimes I don't, uh, I, I'll back away from what I say, so it's, uh, but these are just my views. So. Uh, with that, and you'll see why in a second, um, I want to talk today about the various debates about encryption and other privacy protective technologies. And this has been going on obviously for decades, but it kind of got revived in the past few years with uh, a few court cases and statements from law enforcement officials. And I want to start off with the proposition because I'm, I'm a lawyer, I work with a lot of computer scientists and engineers, but I am not one. Um, I, I try to be, but I am not very good at it. But I do, I am a lawyer, I make arguments for companies, for individuals on cybersecurity matters. And when I take a step back and look at the public debate about encryption and other privacy protective technologies, I frankly get really worried because I am a strong believer in encryption and other technologies that protect content, identities, metadata, anonymity. Uh, I think that it is necessary for national security. I work with a lot of folks from intelligence agencies and strong encryption is vital. That said, the debates and even the successes that the crypto community has had recently I worry about their ability to endure uh, facing challenges that we might see in the future. So what I want to do is come up with some ideas, some other ways to sort of position the debate that might be able to succeed in the future. And again, what I'm going to talk about is just one of many arguments that could be made. And I'm going to mention other ways that um, other arguments in favor of encryption and other technologies. But this is just one example, one argument that I think is very specific to the United States, but also I frankly believe has not been made nearly enough in this context. Um, so just to sort of frame this in one of the more recent uh, series of debates, obviously I'm sure you all know very a lot about the recent Apple versus FBI, both court debates and also in the public Forum. Uh, I've seen many, I'm sure many of you saw former Director Comey testify in, uh, in I think it was the Senate, about uh, the dangers of unbreakable encryption. And there were, a few, there were a few court disputes about this. The most common one or the most sort of cited one was the San Bernardino shooter, uh, who after he died, the government tried to get Apple to help uh, unlock his phone, and it never resulted in a decision on the merits because uh, the FBI was able to have a third party help them access the phone. There was a less high profile case, but I think much more important, that was going on in Brooklyn in 2016, 2015. And this was uh, a drug dealer, or a suspected drug dealer, had been arrested, 
Uh, the DEA and FBI got a warrant to search his iPhone 5S, I believe. And there wasn't the issue of the auto wipe after 10 incorrect tries, but um, the FBI said that it was unable to get into the phone. So what the, uh, so they sought this order from Apple, and also just to say the um, alleged drug dealer said that he forgot his iPhone passcode, which I, I it, it, it's clever, uh, maybe true, may not be. But uh, so what the FBI did was they went to the court and it goes to a magistrate judge. And a magistrate judge is kind of the lowest level judge on the federal system. They're appointed for eight year terms rather than for life. They're not confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and he went to the, or the FBI went to this judge and sought an order under what's up here, the All Writs Act. Uh, and this was a law, it's changed a little bit in wording, but it was passed in 1789, signed into law by George Washington. And what the government said was, under this law, we have a warrant, and now we need a writ, basically an order, necessary or appropriate in aid of the court's jurisdiction and agreeable to the usages and principles of law. And that means Apple needs to help us access this information. So that makes sense, right? You look at that and think that's what that means. Uh, and they're actually, these orders had been issued quite frequently, but for the FBI's bad luck, they ended up uh, going in front of Magistrate Judge Orenstein in Brooklyn. Uh, that was really unfortunate for them because Judge Ornstein uh, had some concerns about this. And he actually forced the parties, Apple and the federal government, to go to court and argue about, does the All Rich require this? Uh, the All Rich Act require this? Apple said no, and the government said yes, and Judge Ornstein issued a 50-page opinion, and I cannot stress... <laughs> Uh, the number of these requests that magistrate judges get every day is overwhelming. And so for him to issue a 50-page opinion on this means that he had strong feelings. And uh, I just excerpted some of it here. Uh, he, used the, uh, he used the word absurd probably, I, I don't even know how many times. But he basically said that the All Rich Act was a gap filler statute but it was never intended to get the courts to basically order companies to do whatever the courts or the federal government want. And he pointed to something called CALEA, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which was passed to require telecommunication service providers like the phone companies to assist in the execution or to make their network susceptible to the execution of uh, wiretap orders. And he's, what he said is the, that CALEA does not cover companies like Apple, and they're specifically excluded. So he said, you know, if Congress looked at one type of company and said they do have to insist, uh, have to assist, but did not with another type of company, then it would be stretching basically the separation of powers to say that the judiciary could read this into this law. And there was an undertone in the statement that was basically saying, you know, this is an old law, in, encryption is a new, or the Apple iPhones are a new thing, um, and I'm not, I'm not going to stretch it to this level. And I have mixed feelings about his order on a policy level, just in terms of what the outcome was. I think it's a good idea, but I also think that invalidating a statute or invalidating the use of a statute because it's old might not be the best way to go about things because we have a lot of old laws on the books. Uh, the All Rich Act is part of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which created all of our federal courts other than the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court's the only court that's required to exist under the Constitution. Congress creates all the other courts. Uh, I would never say, well, you know, I don't think these courts are valid anymore because they're authorized under a new law. But uh, so, so I'm not sure about the reasoning. I think there's been a lot of debate about what he did. But let's just say that Judge Ordenstein was right and that other courts would, in, would adopt his reasoning. We've got a problem here if we want to protect strong encryption for the long term. And that's because what Judge Ordenstein is saying is Congress didn't pass a law that allows this. Congress could pass a law that uh, allows various restrictions on encryption, on anonymity, on privacy protective technologies, 
and I know this sounds like a bit of a conspiracy theory. Um, for those of you who are of my age range, you probably remember what Congress did in 2001. Uh, right after the devastating terrorist attacks, they passed the Patriot Act with barely any opposition. So for, for anyone to think that, the, that a law could not be more restrictive, I think we have to look back in history. So that gets me thinking, what are the defenses that would endure past a, a congressional action on encryption? What I always like to do is look at the Constitution. Is there a constitutional right to privacy, anonymity, uh, and extending that over to encryption? Now, now um, that's a tough one, because the United States Constitution does not have an explicit right to privacy. Uh, other nations do in their constitutions or charters of human rights. But the US doesn't. So we have, to, we have to start looking at where could we find this right? So I like to look at the Constitution. And I'm just looking at some possibilities. Um, and I'll get to the one that I really like right after this. But there's the Second Amendment which actually provides a right to bear arms. And there actually have been some scholars who have said that, or I don't know if they're scholars, but lawyers have said that uh, <laughs> encryption and cyber defenses are arms, and the Second Amendment attaches to that. Um, I've been in a lot of courtrooms, and I would never be comfortable going to a judge and making that argument because they, they would laugh and probably sanction me, so I'm probably not, I, I think that's not gonna work. The Third Amendment, I have a red exclamation point because it's my favorite amendment. Um, it's an amendment that says that soldiers cannot force, it's an amendment that says soldiers cannot force people to quarter them in their homes during times of peace, and only Congress can authorize quartering in times of war. Now, um, there have been some lawyers, a few, who have said this prohibits the NSA from operating in private networks because the NSA's operations are like quartering in someone's home. Uh, that basically, my reaction is the same as the Second Amendment. I don't think that's gonna be very useful. Um, the Fourth Amendment. This is one that has more merit, uh, especially, I'm sure many of you know, the Carpenter decision that came out from the Supreme Court recently, um, and that basically gave a Fourth Amendment expectation of privacy in uh, cell site information. So the Fourth Amendment's useful, but what often gets overlooked is a lot of these encryption disputes happen after a warrant has been issued. So the Fourth Amendment uh, has a warrant requirement and a reasonableness requirement. So I'm concerned that the Fourth Amendment would be of limited utility for a broad defense of privacy protecting technologies. And the other issue is the main remedy under the Fourth Amendment is suppression of evidence in a criminal case. There, you can sue for Fourth Amendment violations, but uh, if we're talking outside of the criminal realm, that's where I get a little concerned. Uh, Fifth Amendment actually can be helpful. We all know, we've all seen in movies the Miranda rights, uh, you have the right to remain silent. Uh, that's all, originates from the right against self-incrimination. Uh, there have been a lot of really interesting cases in the past five years where the government tries to compel people to enter their uh, codes on their phones or their computers, and we've had mixed results. The first thing is that uh, it only applies if it's testimonial. So uh, if you have a thumbprint, this is not legal advice, but um, if you have a thumbprint on your phone, you cannot rely on the Fifth Amendment to protect against uh, compelled unlocking of your phone. The other big limitation is even if you're forced to say the code, that could be seen as testimonial, but the problem is if it's already known that it's your phone. So if you've said to the police, hey, that's my phone, give it back, then it's known as what's a foregone conclusion. So that's not gonna help you all that much. Um, so again, that has limited utility. The Ninth Amendment, this is a law that's uh, 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 an amendment that basically says uh, the enumeration of rights in the Constitution does not mean that you can encumber other existing rights. This is kind of a big academic debate. Uh, I've not seen it that much in the encryption discussion. Uh, the final, the the final amendment that I'd like that I think is worth considering is the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, 
that actually, has, there's been a right to privacy read into that. That's where Roe vs. Wade originates from, as well as uh, the right to contraception. There has not been a tremendous amount of focus on uh, digital privacy in, as applied to the 14th Amendment. I think there actually could be. I think it's a good idea, but there hasn't been very much. Um, California actually does have an explicit right to privacy in its constitution, and they've had a number of really interesting cases involving uh, online privacy, but I don't, but unfortunately the California constitution is just in California, and I think that if you went to the US Supreme Court and told them to apply the California constitution, they would laugh. So uh, that's not gonna happen. Uh, so what I wanna go to is the First Amendment. It's my favorite amendment, uh, and this is admitting my bias. I'm a former journalist. I availed myself of the First Amendment quite a bit. Uh, and what I want to look at is 10 words within the First Amendment, because there's a lot of st great stuff about religion, but that's for another day. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. That is pretty darn simple. Uh, if you look at the free expression rights and the constitutions and charters of other countries, they kind of read like an iTunes terms of service agreement, and I apologize for anyone from Apple, but they have exceptions, they say it doesn't apply in this case. Uh, the US is different. We don't have that in the Constitution. That's not to say that the Supreme Court has not read some, some exceptions. There's exceptions for imminent incitement of um, lawless action. There's exceptions for obscenity, so things like child pornography. Uh, and But if there is a sort of non-exempt type of speech, the court applies various types of scrutiny. So if it's a content neutral regulation, so for example, if the town says, uh, if my town were to say that you can't play music above a certain decibel level after a certain time, that's gonna be easier to justify if the town says uh, Jeff's music is terrible, he cannot play music after a certain time, uh, that's content-based, that's pretty difficult, if not impossible, to justify. So that's the framework of the First Amendment. Uh, now, how it's applied to encryption, I'm sure many of you know about the Bernstein versus DOJ case from the Ninth Circuit. This was back, it actually was through the 90s, there were a number of iterations of it. But uh, what the Ninth Circuit looked at is whether the federal government could require a license, a really onerous licensing process, for the publication of both an article and source code about it for encryption. And what the Ninth Circuit did is they said, this is unconstitutional under the First Amendment, but they looked at an interesting angle. And to do it, they went back to a case from 19, the 1970s uh, New, New York Times versus US. And in that case, the New York Times was gonna be publishing the Pentagon Papers. And uh, this was a classified document that highlighted the US government's missteps in Vietnam. It was very embarrassing to the government. So um, the government sought an injunction to prevent the publication. This is what's known as a prior restraint, preventing speech from happening in the first place. And what the uh, Ninth Circuit, or what the Supreme Court said is a prior restraint is one of the gravest forms of First Amendment violations. It's not like punishing someone after speech has occurred. A prior restraint is actually stopping speech and you have to have an, an exceptionally strong, compelling case for that. Uh, so the Ninth Circuit applied that precedent and said this is the same thing. This is a prior restraint on speech. You're preventing the publication of an article in the source code Another important ruling from this case is that code is speech, which has been used in a number of other contexts. But one thing that I quote over here, which is really interesting, the court said, this affects other rights, such as the right to speak an anonymously, the right against compelled speech, the right to, for informational privacy, uh, when the government restricts encryption, but we leave that for another day. So this is a day that I think we've got to start talking about it, because I think that, um, the Bernstein case could be useful for further, to argue against further restrictions. But for example, but there are a lot of other ways other than publishing the code that there could, encryption and other technologies could be regulated. And I'm not sure if a court would say that's a prior restraint. I think it might, but we've gotta get more creative and have sort of a larger 
frame of arguments. So that's where I want to start talking about how the First Amendment applies to anonymity. And the first thing that I want to talk about is obviously encryption and anonymity are not synonymous, but there's a growing recognition that they work hand in hand together and certain anonymity technologies rely on encryption. Uh, encryption promotes anonymity. Uh, this is a report from the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression uh, saying, yeah, obviously metadata that identifies a person is different than encrypting the content of the communication, but, they, but working together, they create a zone of privacy. And that's what, th that's what I think is missing. I think we look at issues in buckets. We look at encryption, we look at anonymity. And we have to start looking at what are the fundamental values for why we protect each, and how do they work together? So, I think the best way to understand the US, which I will say from the beginning, and this is not because I'm a federal employee, I will say the United States has an exceptional right to anonymity It is uh, compared to other countries. Uh, we value anonymous speech, anonymous expression, far more than many other countries, even some that might surprise you. Uh, so you look at some of the uh, various privacy and anonymity restrictions, uh, China's requirement that companies host encryption keys within China, even though they say there are various uh, restrictions that prevent uh, the government from accessing it. I'll leave that to your judgment. Uh, China also prevent, has a real name law, which says that you can't post anything online without using your real name. Uh, over in Russia, uh, they've recently blocked Telegram because they said terrorists use it. Uh, they also block VPN laws, which some critics say is because they might um, allow some sort of an anti-government news sources. But it's not just the countries that we might question their true democratic values. There are other countries uh, throughout Europe uh, there have been, has been a lot of criticism of their, of anonymity, online anonymity. Europe values traditional informational privacy. Um, I think there's, there could be an argument that that comes at the expense of free expression. You could look at that with the recent GDPR privacy regulations, which uh, resulted in some newspapers not even being accessible. Uh, in Europe, some US newspapers, and you might say it's because the newspapers failed to comply with the privacy regulation, but that demonstrates this tension that we have between sort of traditional privacy values and free speech. Uh, so to understand why and how the United States has these extraordinary protections for anonymity, you have to think back before our founding. Um, so this is John Penry. He was a 16th century Protestant minister from Wales. Um, he and a colleague, uh, John Udall, had published um, a series of tracts that basically very strongly criticized the Anglican Church, which was not a good idea in those days in Wales. Uh, and they, so they published them under Martin Marpley, a pseudonym. And unfortunately for, for John Penry, there was not very strong, Tor did not exist then. Um, so he was tracked down, he was tried within a day and hung in the public square at 4 p.m. So that kind of framed as the colonies were looking at speech, what they believed about the need to communicate privately and anonymously. This guy had a better view, a, a better success of this, uh, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, so he, uh, well, he was successful until he was shot in a duel, but that's a whole different, uh, but in, until that point, he was pretty successful. So uh, he was, to understand why he published anonymously, you have to understand our country's history. So for the first 10 years of the United States, we operated under a confederated government. And that confederated government was just god awful. It, it was terrible. It, the, basically, there was no real central government. We had a president in Congress, but they couldn't do anything because they had no ability to tax. They had no um, central. They had no military. Uh, they had very little policy ability. So the states were doing everything. So you had every state striking, striking trade deals with other countries. You had states coining their own money. 
and states trying to unilaterally defend themselves until there was a rebellion and the states couldn't do it. So this caused Congress to co call a constitutional convention and Alexander Hamilton was among the leaders who said, okay, we, he found this compromise where we had the House represented by population, the Senate represented by state, other ways to sort of balance the concerns of large states and small states. So Congress approves the Constitution, but the states need to ratify it. So Hamilton, and a big concern was New York, because New York did not want to cede so much power to smaller state, not to pick on Rhode Island, but Rhode Island. Um, and so what they wanted to do is make their arguments, and they, they were very prominent figures, but they didn't want themselves to be the focus of these arguments. So what they did is they started sending essays to newspapers throughout New York. Um, and they eventually became known as the Federalist Papers, and they signed them, not with their names, but with uh, a pseudonym, Publius. And the best explain, and there were a few reasons. One was a fear of persecution. Um, they did not want to be persecuted for their beliefs, but there were other reasons also. Um, Alexander Hamilton, in the first Federalist paper, I think he made one of the best arguments for anonymity and privacy. Uh, my motives must remain in the depository of my own breast. My arguments will be open to all and may be judged by all. They shall at least be offered in a spirit which will not disgrace the cause of truth. So that was his argument for anonymity, and it prevailed. Uh, so the Supreme Court started to recognize anonymity as the heart of US democracy. Um, the first case to really recognize this was in 1958. There's a case called NAACP versus Alabama. This was during the Civil Rights Movement, desegregation. Uh, the Alabama state government started trying to pass laws to really crack down on opposition group, groups that they viewed as opposing them, including the NAACP, one of their laws required the publication of the names of everyone who is a member and an officer. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. <laughs> they said, uh, by doing that, even though it's not restricting them from speaking directly, by associating their names with an unpopular group that can actually, that has been persecuted, you're chilling their speech, and that, and that violates the First Amendment. So that was, it, it was interesting because it wasn't a direct restriction on speech, but it was a restriction on association. The next case came a few years later. Um, this was uh, someone who was collecting signatures and, uh, or campaigning for, against companies in Los Angeles that discriminated against racial minorities in employment. Um, he distributed these pamphlets without his name on it that violated the Los Angeles ordinance that required people to identify themselves. And the Supreme Court at this point went all in on the history, he started talking about John Henry and saying, we don't want to live in a society like that. And even the Federalist Papers demonstrate that anonymity is used for the most constructive purposes. So this was probably the high watermark for um, for anonymity. This was the Supreme Court saying, this is part of our history. Um, so we have Cali, but the, and which, which applied to all handbills. But the problem was, there were other states that started saying, okay, we won't restrict all communications, but we will restrict any communications related to elections, because that, there's a, an interest in doing that. So Ohio was one of the states that said, if you are a, um, if you're campaigning for a ballot initiative or a candidate, you have to use your name on any of the campaign materials. There's a woman named Margaret McIntyre who did not want a school bond passed through a referendum, so she started distributing materials without her name on it. Um, the Supreme Court said, you cannot find her because even though this is just restricted to elections, again, this is an unpopular view. She's going around saying, I don't want the schools to be funded. She can remain anonymous. Uh, the next case was a little different. It, in, it involved a requirement that people who collect ballot initiatives uh, have to wear ID badges with their real names. The Supreme Court once again said, this violates the First Amendment, going back to the Federalist Papers, Tally McIntyre. 
Uh, and the most recent case, not all that recent anymore, was an ordinance that said if you campaign door to door, you have to register with your real name with the government. And what the government said is, if you're going door to door, people see your face, it doesn't matter. Um, and the Supreme Court disagreed and said, again, this basically will chill speech and it will make it more difficult for people to, um, to speak because they might not want their names to be on record with the government. So that's the Supreme Court stance on anonymity. Now, how does it apply online? It actually has applied online pretty, pretty robustly. Uh, so actually, just to, just to back up, the way that it typically works, there have been a lot of disputes, you may have heard of them, where someone is um, sued for violating, a, for defaming someone online. So there's an anonymous poster on a bulletin board online or a newspaper and a, new, a news website's comments who posts anonymously or pseudonymously says something that really upsets the subject. The subject wants to sue. They don't know who to sue because they can't sue someone named anonymous or whatever they want to put on there. Uh, they also just tangentially, they can't sue the website. There's uh, a law in the books called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. I have a book coming out about it next spring. Please buy it. It's a great beach read. Um, and that what, what that law says is that you can't sue a website except in very limited circumstances for content created by third parties. So they've got to find it. If they want to sue, they need to find out who they're suing. So typically what they do, and this is the very easiest scenario, typically it's much more complex, but they'll file a lawsuit against someone named John Doe, and then they use discovery in that case to issue a subpoena to the website for the IP address and any registration information. Sometimes the sites require email addresses. And then if they have the IP address, they go to the ISP and issue a second subpoena for the subscriber information. And as you all might expect, there have been some hilarious mishaps in identifying grandparents who don't secure their Wi-Fi connections, which I'm sure is not an issue for anyone in this room. But uh, that, that's the easiest way. There's obviously a lot of glitches in it. So what courts have had to do is say, okay, we have McIntyre, we have all these cases that say there's a right to anonymity. How does this apply uh, on the internet? The first case to deal with this was a case where um, the company Columbia Insurance owned Seize Candy, which seems to be in every shopping mall in the United States. Uh, there was someone who registered SeizeCandy.com domain, but it was anonymous. And so Columbia Insurance wanted to get the identifying information about this person uh, who registered it. And the court had never really confronted it before, and they said, okay, we'll let you have the discovery, but you have to really tell us why you need it and what other steps you've taken. So that was the first case. It didn't go through all that much detail. The first big case was a, a publicly traded ISP called To The Mart. Uh, there were investors who are people who commented on the investments in the stock who did not like the management. I posted a few of the comments up here that they, that, that they added, and then subsequently they were, the company was sued by shareholders. So what To The Mart wanted to do is find out who posted these comments. So they subpoenaed the company that owned the website and said, we want to know who these people are. Um, so what To The Mart said is McIntyre doesn't apply because one of the users challenged it and said this violates my First Amendment rights. And the argument there was that McIntyre and all those other cases involved restrictions on the ability to speak. All of these people spoke already. There's no right to remain anonymous forever. And the court basically soundly rejected this. They said, if you don't have the right to remain anonymous, then you don't have the right to speak anonymously. And they set forth a test that basically looks at how strong is your case, uh, are you trying to harass people? Do you need this information? And then the court said, we're not going to grant it. We're going to get rid of the subpoena. And they made some great statements about how the free exchange of ideas is so important on the internet for First Amendment purposes. There's another case a few months later uh, called Dendrite International v. Doe. Again, this was a company, and just as a side note, any lawyers who deal with defamation cases, 
see that companies that have people post about their share prices are among the most common plaintiffs in these defamation cases. Um, and so they were saying, so it was a typical case, uh, the company wanted to get the identifying information about the posters. And the um, poster and the posters challenged that. And the court said, no, you can't do that uh, because we don't have any evidence that this really harmed the share prices of the company. Uh, and the last sort of defamation case, there was a city councilman in Delaware and uh, someone posted something saying that he demonstrates obvious mental deterioration on a local news blog. Uh, councilman was not happy about this filed the typical lawsuit, and the court here said, we're gonna apply a really high standard that's really difficult to meet, and he didn't meet it. So these are some examples of how courts have really said anonymity is at the center of, our, of, of US First Amendment law. Uh, an interesting case not in the defamation context, uh, Doe v. Harris, the Harris in this case is Senator Kamala Harris, who was the Attorney General of California at the time, every state has a sex offender registry law. Um, the California law was amended to say that uh, sex offend uh, offenders have to uh, register all of their internet identifiers and their ISPs. And uh, a challenge, one person anonymously obtained a preliminary injunction saying this violates the First Amendment. Uh, all because you can't speak anonymously if you have to register all your names with the government. And the Ninth Circuit said, yeah, this isn't the classical anonymous speech case, um, but it chills anonymous speech because of this disclosure requirement. And now the Ninth Circuit, I'll, full disclosure, I clerked for a judge on the Ninth Circuit. Um, the Ninth Circuit has a reputation of not always following what the Supreme Court might want the Ninth Circuit. To follow, there was a judge who actually recently passed away who had a famous saying that the Supreme Court can't catch them all. Um, so you might, you might think that this is a really liberal ruling, but the author of this ruling is a judge named Jay Bybee, who some of you may know. Uh, he was appointed by George W. Bush, but he worked earlier in the Bush administration and he was one of the authors of the torture memos. So um, this isn't, some sort of radical liberal saying this. This is a fairly conservative judge saying, even in this case where the defendants are not sympathetic, we're gonna find that they have this right to anonymous speech. Uh, and then finally, there was a case recently in the DC circuit, the appeals court in uh, Washington DC, which basically there was a challenge to the FEC's rules that said you only have to disclose the names of, of people who donate uh, to companies um, for election communications, but not for other types of communications. And the FE, so the FEC said, one of, one of the reasons they justified it is said, well, you know, we need to safeguard anonymous speech, so this is a balance. And the DC Circuit agreed with it and said that these sort of, this is firmly entrenched in the S Supreme Court's First Amendment jurisprudence. So they recognize the strong right and, uh, to anonymity in a different context. So to apply these rights, I, I just want to stress that obviously we've not confronted a case on anonymous speech quite like this. But I think we need to start thinking about how we can uh, make these arguments effective. And as I think I have shown today, this is an extraordinary right that we have in the United States. And if you think about the various ways that governments in other countries crack down on VPNs, on anonymity technologies, on encryption, that can really chill the synonymous speech that has been at the forefront of our democracy since our founding. Uh, but there's another reason, and I, I've lived in the Washington DC area for a long time, so I tend to think of things in policy, political terms, um, and one judge, I remember saying that the Supreme Court is the most powerful policy-making body in the United States. Um, the, so the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court likes to say that he calls balls and strikes. Um, but there are a lot of cases where it does come down to a policy judgment. And the First Amendment is a place where the First, Amend the First Amendment is winning in the Supreme Court. 
Uh, these are just some recent cases where the Supreme Court has decided First Amendment issues, and it's almost always deciding it in favor of First Amendment rights. Now, there's Citizens United, which I imagine some people are not all that thrilled about, which allows um, unlimited expenditures for campaigns. There's also U.S. v. Alvarez. That was a case where the Supreme Court said you can't ban speech or you can't exempt speech from the First Amendment simply because it's a lie. That was a case where there was something called the Stolen Valor Act, which made it a crime to lie about military honors. Uh, someone was running for a local government position. Uh, and he made the statement in a public forum that he was the recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is not really bright because there's very few living people who are the recipients of the, you, you would lie about something different. So he was prosecuted, but the Supreme Court said, you cannot prosecute someone just for lying. Snyder v. Phelps, that involved uh, the fine people from the Westboro Baptist Church who um, picketed the funeral of a fallen soldier, and the family sued uh, the church for intentional infliction of uh, emotional distress. The Supreme Court expressed significant sympathy for the family, but said, you know, we, the First Amendment prevails. Uh, Agency for International Development, that involved a restriction on AIDS funding, AIDS prevention funding to nonprofit organizations um, that had a string uh, attached saying you had to make a statement against prostitution. That was found to be compelled speech. The Janus case, that actually was, was issued a few months ago. That's where the Supreme Court said you, um, that state employees cannot be compelled to donate to unions. And finally, uh, U.S. v. Stevens, that struck down a ban on depiction on animal cruelty. So there's some sort of theories from some people that say, well, the, the Supreme Court is weaponizing the First Amendment in favor of corporations with cases like Janus and Citizens United. Others say, you know, the First Amendment is just at its highest peak right now. So that's the political reason, and it feels weird to talk about the politics of the Supreme Court, but if there's a challenge to encryption, other privacy protecting technologies, I really do think that um, sort of focusing on this line of reasoning that goes back to our nation's history could be a very successful way to go rather than sort of rehashing the same arguments about how statutes work. And um, obviously there are pragmatic considerations such as uh, you can't ban math, but that's uh, a whole other situation. Um, but, but again, I think we need to be focusing on the best constitutional arguments. Um, and I think this is a good place to start. So I wanted to leave a little time for questions or comments or anything like that, because I do want it to be a dialogue. Uh, that's also loud. A lot of your conversation seems to be about protecting privacy between individuals and the government. What about individuals and corporations, which are way worse offenders, in my opinion, and also the government's ability to get your information from corporations, and you're completely outside the decision-making matrix on that? Yeah, I think that's a great point, and I think that keeping information from corporations is one step in sort of preventing both the corporations and governments from doing it, uh, from, from obtaining it. But a lot of these anonymity cases, it was corporations seeking the data. So I think that protecting strong encryption and other technologies is a way to both have, have privacy from the government and from corporations, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. So obviously there's been a lot of talk recently about you know fake news and the whole idea of that. And I was, I was interested to get your thoughts on, I mean, obviously you mentioned the U.S. Alvarez case or whatever like that, you know, about lying or whatever. But how, how do you feel like that's going to fit into the whole picture as people, you know, as there's all this talk about cracking down on fake news you know, and that sort of thing? Like, what, how, how do you think that that's going to play into all of this? 
So I think it's dangerous. I, I, I think the fake news, like the crazy things on Facebook that pop up, that it's a problem. But I also worry about government regulations that will say what types of news that you can and can't broadcast or put on a platform because who's making those judgments? I think, I, I will give them credit, a lot of the platforms, Twitter, Facebook, they've started to make much better efforts along those lines and it is market-based. I mean, if I, I would hope it would be that if you continue to get garbage news from a platform, you'll go to another platform. Obviously, there are economic barriers to that, but um, I, I don't see under the First Amendment precedent how the government would be able to restrict that. Hi, so in the context of that 3D printed gun design case that's going on right now, um, mm -hmm. is there anything that says that like it's futile so we shouldn't restrict this speech? And generally, what do you think about that case? So that, that's a good question, and I think we need to distinguish between sort of the design and the actual manufacturer. I, I have trouble seeing that, that it's speech itself, uh, the actual gun, ma making 3D right. printed guns. So I, I, I think that it would be tough to really make a strong enough First Amendment argument on that. Thanks. I just want to ask a little more broad question to you about um, you, early on in your talk, you talked about how um, poking at early precedents in early legal precedents in our history could kind of open up a can of worms where like more and more laws upon which our entire system of government is based could be caught, called into question. And I'm just wondering if um, uh, you're, if like all of the things that are going on in our democracy right now around like perhaps laws that aren't being broken, but um, precedents that are being flouted, right, by uh, the executive branch and others. I, I'm interested in hearing your general concerns about the extent to which our system of government is dependent on um, precedents and other customs that are not actually codified into law, and whether we're seeing threats that, significant threats, I guess, as a result of those um, precedents that are being flouted that aren't necessarily laws themselves. So you're talking about norms of behavior? Yeah, yeah, in, in all, three exec all three branches of government, right? Yeah, I mean, I... I and, I think, and the press for that matter as well. Yeah, I, I think there's blame to go around in terms of um, various norms. I think there a lot of norms that have been flouted for a long time. I... I think for courts, it's a little different. Um, Justice Breyer has this theory of active liberty, that basically the Constitution, is, we need to inter interpret the Constitution in light of today's setting. And in that context, uh, the late Justice Scalia had a very strong original spent where he said, you need to interpret the Constitution as it would have been interpreted in uh, the 1700s. I've got to say Justice Breyer's reasoning is more compelling and we have a lot of rights and um, very positive developments because of this active liberty uh, viewpoint. But I, I think that norms are tough because if, if they're not codified into a statute or in the constitution or regulations, there is room to um, deviate. And that's, I mean, I've always been a big believer in getting things into statutes <laughs> because then, we're, then we don't have to worry as much about what is the norm and who's violating it. So are you worried that these norms are going to lead to sort of deterioration of our democracy? Yeah, I mean, I, so my, my specialty is um, the online speech, cybersecurity, and I worry about the norms of behavior um, online. And I mean, I think this, is, this has been for 10, 20 years now, but I think that the way, I, I, we talk a lot about what's Twitter's responsibility, what's uh, Facebook's responsibility, but I worry a lot of it is that people, how, I mean, if you don't have the bad behavior, then you're not going to have the problems. And I, I think that that's what concerns me the most. I mean, you, you see what people do online and you think, would they do it in person, face to face? And I, I, so I mean that that's frankly because that's what I really specialize in. 
when, when I look at, I mean, I, I see a lot of what mo I've observed moderators and how they moderate content, and that really concerns me because I don't know how you solve people being some people being horrible people. <laughs> That's not. Yeah, thank you. I was mostly asking about the way our government officials are behaving sure. and their flouting of norms, but I, I've already taken too okay, much time. Sorry. So thanks a lot sure. for your time. Yeah. All right. Uh, I can't remember his name, so if you do. You tell me. But a British statesman once said, your right to do as you please stops at the tip of my nose. Where's the other side? In other words, what protects me against your First Amendment rights if the right to lie is protected? That, that's a good question. And if you look at other countries, it's the reverse. Um, the Euro Europe, for example, for the past few years has recognized a right to be forgotten. If, you, if there's something online that you believe is harmful to you, either false or true, you can demand that it be de-indexed from search engines. So if someone searches for your name, they're not going to get the result. There's a trade-off with free expression because it, I think it's a little Orwellian to erase history. And I, in the United States, that wouldn't fly. But I think that's just a value judgment. I think you make a really good point, though. That's definitely a very strong uh, counter argument to free expression. Okay, thank you. Hi. A, a Bill rang with me a little bit when you were talking about, you know, how when do people know when it's right or it's wrong? And kind of, I'm in education. And so one of the things that comes to mind is education. And do you see anonymity and privacy playing a role within education, K through 12, within the next generation to kind of circle. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. <laughs> Would you see um, ideas on anonymity and privacy playing a role within K through 12 education in the future years in order to kind of circumvent that entire issue that we have going on of people knowing the difference between right and wrong when conducting themselves on the internet? I think so. At the K through 12 level, um, California, for example, has passed a law that allows minors to request the deletion of information they've provided to sites right. once they turn 18. And I, so I think that's, there, there's some trade-offs, but that's generally a positive development because I, I didn't have social media when I was in high school, but I sure as hell would have posted stupid stuff on there that I'd want yeah. offline for the rest right, of my life. Right. So would you say there is a need for that within K through 12? I think so. For K through 12, I, I, yeah, because I mean, I. I, I have a four-year-old daughter, and I'm going to keep her offline as long as humanly possible. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I think, I think we're at uh, 10.50, so uh, thank you very much.